Tyler, if it should turn out that Innocent has a challenge, have we seen him in yet? If he has a challenge, should we just let Grace kick things off or would I, we'll wait for a few minutes, obviously. It's not even time yet, but yeah. as a backup plan, should we just start with Grace then? Yes, absolutely. And I think, um, I think Innocent has joined as an attendee, so I'm trying to promote him to panelist. Okay. Tizai and Yannick, good to see you both also. Yes, good Carol, to see you. it's uh... 4 a.m. here, so. No, it's very early <laughs> for you to die. Thank you. But I love this work, so I have to. I have to be here. All right, and I think innocent Hello, do you hear me? is now. Hi everyone. Hello, do you hear hi, me? Hi Grace. Hey Grace. Hi, hi. You. I was. I was having a challenge in getting the sound, but I've managed and. Uh, Perhaps, um, Taylor, I'm trying to answer this question. Tell us about you. And when I try to click on the, um, the icon that I want to respond to, it's not active. Is it for us or for the participants? It's only for the participants, Grace. So the hosts will okay. not, and the panelists, we're not going to be answering the, um, the question about where we're from. All right. OK. Hello. Good morning, Innocent. Bonjour. Good morning, yes. Happy to see everyone. See each and everyone face. Nana, Ama, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you too? I'm fine. How is Ghana? Hello. 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 Ghana is fine. fine. Getting ready for the Hi, election. Tizai. You're fine. I'm from Kenya. It is, it is 3 p.m. here. <laughs> Hi, young Nick. Hi, Yannick. Hi, Grace. <laughs> nice to see you again. Hi, Tizai, Dr. Tizai. Hey, uh, Grace, is that you talking? Yes, it is me talking. Yes, Grace. I, I was just saying, I think I was speaking, I was on mute. Uh, I said it's 4 a.m. here in Seattle, but I'm from Zimbabwe, so I can do it 3 p.m. as well. Uh, 1, 1 p.m. <laughs> 1, 1 p.m. in Zimbabwe now. So. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's, it's okay. Thanks so much for, for the commitment and creating time. Hi, Justus. Hi, how are you? Fine. How is Nairobi? <laughs> Where you are? <laughs> Nairobi is, is fine. Um, we are doing good. Okay. You know, in some part of Nairobi, it's cold, it's raining and all that. Hi, Innocent. Nice to see you. And hi, Carol. Good to see you also, Grace. Um, and yeah, and it's wonderful to he have everyone here and that people are well and safe in these difficult times. Mm. Hi, George. Okay, I don't know if he's there. Hi, Taylor. Hi there. Okay, so we are just waiting a moment, Tyler, to try to sort out the interpreter issue. Yeah, so fortunately he's having trouble connecting, um, so I'm trying to get that resolved. Should we let folks know that we'll be with them in just a moment? Mm-hmm, absolutely.
Okay, I'll send a note to everyone and let them know that we'll be right with them. Okay. Oh, sorry, I meant to send that to everybody. Sorry, let me change this to everyone. Well, shall we um, shall we proceed? Um, I'm I'm still unfortunately uh, having trouble getting our interpreter connected. He seems to be having a connection issue. Innocent, would you like to go ahead and get us started? Innocent, would you like to uh, get the panel started? Hello. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes, Hello. go Do you hear me? Hello? Innocent, Innocent please go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, so uh, just uh, one minute. I want to uh trans transfer the the link to our translator Hello, good afternoon, everyone.
So we are here today to analyze what is the good practice for the youth to success in agriculture sectors is concerned. So that's why we are here. So we will share some experience. We will share some good practice. We will share many things. So we will learn from the participant and the participants will learn again from us. So we are very happy that we have the translator on the board. So we have French translator and English translator on the board. So we are very happy. So right now we will start with um, our, our topic. So one again, welcome panelists and estimate guests to our webinar, Practice of African Youth Access to Land for Prosperous Agriculture, which promises insights into the current state of youth access and right to land in Africa. Current effort to promote youth engagement in agriculture and lesson learned. Our expert panelist is compromise of representative from African society, African civil society, international NGOs, and multinational to offer their own unique perspective on the challenge. And opportunity is strengthening youth right to learn. So right now, we will introduce our panelists in the moment. But first, I would like to welcome our moderators. I want to tell Grace Ananda and Carol Boudreau, who will guide our discussion. So who is Carol Boudreau? Carol Boudreau is the chief program officer at Landesa. She is an Antone and land rights expert with two decades of experience in the field and the researcher. Throughout her career, while working in the both the public and private sectors, she has supported improvement to the land tenure and research rights of individuals and communities around the world. We face strong focus on women's land rights, responsible land-based investment and conflict, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So Carol, welcome. Right now, who is another Grace? She is a women's land rights expert. Expert with extensive experience in policy, influence and advocacy engagement around the African Union. The region economic blocks, civil society, organization, and government. She has worked with no, many international NGOs, including Osfam, Action Aid, Catholic Relief Services, and ACE Africa, and has lead team and consortium members in Kenya and across Africa 
on women land rights advocacy and global solidarity actions. One again, Grace Another, you are welcome. So right now, I will let the floor to our moderators to continue with the discussion and the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Innocent, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon from here in Nairobi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are listening us from. As Innocent has already introduced me, my name is Grace Ananda, and I'll be the moderator for the day uh, for the first, first, first part of the webinar. First, I would like to just pass a buzz. Uh, did you know that uh, the world's youngest countries are all in Africa, with focus for 2020 showing just one non-African country, which is Afghanistan, in top 20. Such a large number of young people present both challenges and opportunity for the continent. According to a report by World Population Prospect that was published in 2019. This webinar has come timely when all when, when we are all celebrating the International Africa Industrialization Day, which is always celebrated on 20th November. When I looked at 2020 theme, I asked myself how best youth can sustainably and meaningfully contribute to the realization of free continental trade area if they are secure, if their land right is not secure. Before we begin our program, a quick overview of today's discussion. First, we will hear from a few of our panelists about on-ground realities for Africa youth. What do we know about youth land rights? And where are the gaps? What are the obstacles and also opportunities? Following that discussion, we will open up to questions from our audience. We will then turn to the second half of our program centered on the best practices and opportunities for governments policymakers and other stakeholders to strengthen youth land rights in Africa. I kindly request us to share comments, questions using the chat box below, which will be answered at the end of the first round of this webinar. I will, intro I will introduce our panelists uh, in a few moments, but first I would like to talk briefly about why tenor security for young people or youths is key in the implementation and the achievement of African Union Agenda 2063 as a contributing factor to achieving the Sustainable Development Goal. Youth make up large share of population in developing countries, and it's important to create employment for them. This can be achieved if youths are allowed to use land productively to enhance economic growth. Noting that, Good land governance is cited as critical to achieving Agenda 2063 and building the Africa we want, particularly goals related to quality of life, agriculture, environment, peace and security, and not forgetting goal, goal number 18 of engaged and empowered youths and children. It is therefore important for African governments to implement fully the African Union framework and guideline on land policy in Africa, at the national level and promote the domestication and framework and guidelines. Besides, the guiding principles on large-scale land-based investment in Africa, key targets and indicators associated with African Union Agenda 2063, which is supposed to be achieved by 2023, the 10 implementation plan, ensuring equitable access to land for women, men, and also youth. As we start the decade of action to achieve sustainable development goal, we need to commit more constantly to ensure equal sustainable access to land for young people across Africa. Regarding this, Youth Initiative for Land in Africa, ILA, in partnership with CADASTA, Land Portal, Landesa, Coladev, Afimid.com, Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, is having a series of webinars to discuss how best Youths can be involved in land governance in Africa as a, as a contributing factor to achievement of African Union Agenda 2063, Aspiration 6, an Africa whose development is people-centered, driven, relying on the potential offered by African people, especially its women and youths. 
and also sustainable development goal. Let me welcome our first panelists, Innocent Antoine Huji. He's the coordinator of Youth Initiative for Land in Africa, has over 10 years of experience in land expert management, business planning, financial analyst, and also, and also software engineering. Before founding Yela in 2019, Innocent Antoine worked on Millennium Challenge Corporation Lands Access Project in Benin. He has previously held various positions in Benin, most recently as regional head of office of the Benin National Agency for Land Affairs and Domain. Welcome, Innocent. Our second panelist is Nana Ama. Nana Ama is, the land, is a land economist, development policy analyst, and gender specialist with over 25 years' experience in land, natural resources governance, policy, land, policy, land policy research and advocacy, and women land rights. She's, she's, she's the founder and executive director of Coladef. She oversees the strategic direction of the organization, manages engagement with partners, and lead Coladef National Policy Advocacy Agenda. You're welcome, Nana Ama. And our third panelist in our first round of the webinar is Dr. Tizai Mauto. Dr. Tizai is Landesa Land Tenor and Youth Specialist, provides land policy analysis and implementation experts on rural land tenor security, and the importance of youth access to land for improving livelihood and promoting economic development. He has previously worked on youth focus program with UN Habitant and the Global Land Tool Network and as an urban planner for the government of Zimbabwe. Welcome Dr. Tizai Mauto. Now on our first question, discussion, we will focus on obstacles and opportunities for Youth land rights. To you, innocent Antoine, could you just give us a brief on um, what are the obstacles that youth face in accessing land? Thank you. To you, innocent. Okay, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, merci infiniment à chacun et à tous. Uh, je crois que aujourd'hui la question. Euh, du foncier des jeunes est une question préjudiciable et c'est une question Hello? et c'est une question préjudiciable et à cet effet à cet effet il est important de comprendre il est important de comprendre que à cet effet il est important de comprendre que Sorry. Donc, euh, je disais que les obstacles aujourd'hui qui euh, entravent euh, donc, la question du foncier des jeunes aujourd'hui euh, en Afrique est de plusieurs ordres. Et d'abord, lorsque nous regardons un peu, nous constatons qu'il y a des obstacles d'ordre socio-culturel. Et quand on parle d'obstacles socioculturels, il s'agit donc des coutumes. Aujourd'hui, dans nos sociétés, nous constatons qu'il y a le système patriarcal qui empêche les jeunes d'avoir assez à la terre. De la même façon, nous constatons que dans certaines familles, on n'octroie pas la terre aux jeunes de la famille. La famille, la terre est la chose gardée, est la chasse gardée donc des, des grandes personnes. De la même façon, nous avons constaté que dans nos coutumes, il y a plusieurs règles suivant les régimes, suivant euh, euh, les familles qui bloquent donc ce problème-là. Il y a aussi une question d'ordre éducatif. Donc, il y a l'éducation aussi qui constitue un obstacle véritable. Et l'obstacle véritable au niveau, c'est le manque de formation au niveau des jeunes. Les jeunes n'ont pas la formation. Les jeunes 
n'ont pas la formation en matière foncière. Et ça fait que nous n'arrivons pas à avoir des jeunes engagés sur les questions foncières pour pouvoir booster l'agriculture. Et ça, c'est des solutions que nous devons mettre en place pour renforcer la capacité des jeunes, renforcer la capacité de nos différents jeunes. Alors, donc, après ça, nous allons constater qu'il y a aussi des obstacles d'ordre politique et économique. D'ordre politique et économique, il y a d'abord les jeunes qui ne sont pas associés aux différents lieux de décision. Ça veut dire que les jeunes, on ne les associe pas à des instances de décision. Et ne les associant pas, cela permet, ne permet pas aux jeunes de comprendre réellement qu'ils ont un rôle véritable à jouer, qu'ils ont un statut dans le système donc de la gouvernance foncière. Il y a aussi des questions d'ordre juridique. Les questions d'ordre juridique, beaucoup de jeunes ne connaissent pas les lois de leur pays. Beaucoup de jeunes ne connaissent pas les lois de leur pays. Ils ne connaissent pas quels sont les droits que la loi foncière de leur pays leur donne. Et ça fait que parfois, ils sont ignorants donc des tests. Ils ne savent pas que ce que la loi leur concède. Et à ce titre, ils ne sont pas proactifs pour pouvoir saisir les opportunités agricoles qui se pointent dans leur pays. Donc voilà autant d'obstacles qui bloquent un peu l'accès des jeunes à la terre en Afrique. Et l'autre chose, c'est que nous n'avons pas des données fiables. Nous n'avons pas des données fiables pour pouvoir faire des analyses, pour pouvoir tirer des solutions pour pouvoir tirer des conclusions afin de pouvoir mettre en place des modèles économiques qui pourraient permettre à ces jeunes d'avoir les bonnes pratiques en matière foncière, les bonnes pratiques d'accès à la terre. Aujourd'hui, quand tu prends un jeune, tu lui dis, bon, comment, quelle est la stratégie que tu as à adopter pour pouvoir avoir une, 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 un lopin de terre afin de pouvoir eh, devenir entrepreneur agricole? Le jeune ne sait pas. Le jeune ne sait pas. Donc, il est important pour nous de faire savoir, de vulgariser les lois, de vulgariser les tests juridiques pour permettre à nos différents jeunes dans différents pays de pouvoir connaître leurs droits et devoirs. Donc, voilà autant d'obstacles. Donc, à tout casser, je dis, il y a des obstacles sociologiques et culturels, des, ob des obstacles juridiques, des obstacles économiques et politiques et des obstacles en matière de l'éducation et de la formation. Merci beaucoup, eh, Madame Grace. Ah, thank you, merci beaucoup, Innocent. Thanks so much for for your presentation. You are just on time, and I would kindly request you just to uh, summarize it in English for some of our English-speaking participants. And I would also like to remind the, the, the participants that uh, in the event you have any question, kindly uh, use the chat box to write questions and also comments. And uh, we will let you know once we, our, interpreter, our interpreter is on board. So Innocent, just give us a summary of what you've just shared with us. Good morning. Yeah, I would like to... And so first of all, I would like to uh, put all people the man of uh, this is a track. We have many men who are going to practice the law. There is no access to New York. There is no access to the
Okay, thanks so much, George, uh, for summarizing what Innocent just mentioned about issues to do with the practical society where we come from, the traditional uh, societies, what is making youth not access land and to be productive uh, uh, in it. Okay, to my second panelist, Nana Ama, you work in Ghana. What employment opportunity exists for young workers, particularly those living in the rural area? I would also like to remind participants that in the event you have any questions or comments, use the chat box below so that we will be able to respond to your comments and also questions uh, at the end of the first session of the panelists, of the discussion, sorry. To you, Nana Aman. Thank you very much, Grace, and um, a warm welcome to all our participants and my fellow panelists. And I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to be part of this panel. So on the key question as to what employment opportunities exist for young workers, especially in living in rural areas in Ghana, as we all know, rural Ghana, and in fact, rural Africa, has the main economic activity to be farming. And in many cases, you have small scale farming as the mainstay of the economic um, or income opportunities for many of the people in the rural areas. So for the youth, what it means is that if we are looking at employment opportunities for youth living in rural areas, then we are looking at agriculture as the main activity. However, currently looking at the dynamics in the land sector in Ghana, we would say that there are three ways for women, rural youth to have employment opportunities in agriculture in Ghana. One way youth in Ghana can access land to be employed in agriculture is for them to be part of the land owning group. You know, in Ghana, the lands are held under customary arrangements. So you have a land owning group, maybe a, a group of clans or a family or a school with its members. So if a youth is part of this land owning group, a youth is able to access land so that they can engage in farming to be employed in that sense. There is also this aspect of land access through households. So youth are members of households. And so as members of households, they can benefit to access land that belongs to the household. And this happens in many rural areas in Ghana where you have a family, a man and his wife and his children, youth being part of the children and extended family, in fact. And so all of them are able to access land that belongs to the household. But there is also this third aspect of opportunity for employment, which is emerging. And this is based on the government policy. So currently we have programs such as the government planting for food and jobs or the one district, one factory policy where the government acquires large areas of land and they, they actually uh, provide funding to implement certain rural economic activities like agriculture, uh, poultry, um, livestock rearing, and so on and so forth. So youth have opportunity to be part of this also to be gainfully employed. So three areas, through the clan or family or school as one, through the household and also through the government policy. But the point is, for Ghana, and I know for most parts of Africa, the challenge for youth is not necessarily the access to land because many rural areas have large tracts of land that a youth can also enjoy. The access is not the issue. There are many challenges beyond the access. Yes, go on, Nana. People within that age are considered youth. Considered eligible to be holders of a certain valuable property in land. 
And therefore, even if such a person is part of a clan, is part of a household, or is part of any government policy, it is not considered that such a person qualifies culturally to hold a property in land. And so it becomes quite challenging for youth of that nature to be part of the discussion in land. There is also a certain cultural, social, political, and historical context for Ghana's natural resource governance. And this influences decision-making, access control, and benefit sharing in land. What I mean by that is, so if you take a clan that owns a large area of land, the leadership of the clan are the ones who make decisions on who accesses land and for how long and how much. The leadership are all the elderly ones, the old men who are in some cases not even having the energy to do effective farming, but are the ones in charge of decision making. They are the ones in charge to hold the custodians of the allodial title and land. And therefore the youth are excluded in that sense. And that creates a lot of difficulties for the youth because the access they are granted is not guaranteed by virtue of their not being able to be part of the decision making. Another challenge in Ghana is also the increasing threats of dispossession because of the changing dynamics in the land markets in most rural areas in Ghana. Because today we have a lot of commercial activities in Ghana where you have companies, corporations going into the rural areas to acquire large tracts of land for commercial agricultural activities or other investments. And usually what happens is that because they come with the lump sum payment for the land, there is the interest to give it to them and many of the people are dispossessed. And these ones are the ones who are not part of the decision making and especially being the youth and the women. The non involvement of the decision making processes also affects how much they are able to invest in the activity because they are not certain what outcome they can get eventually. There is also lack of information. And I know Innocent mentioned that in his presentation. Many of the youth don't know anything about the land situation and they are not considered to be qualified to have access to that information. So if you go to many of these traditional areas, a youth being 15 to 35 years, even if you ask questions about the land that the community owns, you will not be considered seriously, you will not be taken seriously, you will not have much information. And I give my own myself as, a, as an example. Even for me, at the time I graduated with land economy background and having done some work at that time, I wasn't considered, my father would not give me details of what situations he's facing on his land. And yet he had large tracts of land in different parts of the country. By the time he realized that he needed to get me involved because it would benefit the family, it was too late. And now we have lost most of the land that we were supposed to protect. So it's a, a critical issue beyond access, the dynamics of the involvement, the participation, the guarantee of security, the information flow is a huge issue. The other issue is also the lack of access to benefits from communally owned land. So you have, I am a member of a clan and the clan has a large part of land and the land could be granted to an investor to undertake a certain economic activity. The results, the benefits that come from that activity is supposed to be for all members of the clan, but okay. it doesn't happen. The youth are not part of this and therefore it creates a lot of tensions within the community. And finally, finally, there are also certain expectations from the youth, so or of the youth. So adults or older ones in the community expect youth to be quiet, just like we have in the gender dynamics. So youth are supposed to be quiet. When older ones are talking, you don't have to talk. I am 50 years and yet I'm expected to keep quiet when my older ones are talking because I am not yet, I mean, they are still alive. And so I have to wait for them to talk before, you know, anything can. Okay. Thank you so much, Nana Ama. Uh, I've picked that uh, youths are left out when it comes to uh, decision-making processes on matter pertaining land governance in Ghana, and mostly 
these groups or decision, the, the people who make decisions, they're mostly elderly. So now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Tizai Mauto, who is going to share with us uh, a few issues uh, concerning uh, youth in agriculture. So Dr. Tizai, what does the existing research tell us about youth engagement in agriculture and the rural youth access to land? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Grace. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, uh, emerging research uh, out there, but I'll just uh, very quickly uh, summarize uh, what's, what's coming out, uh, at least clearly. Uh, so one trend uh, that's very clear from research is that um, uh, rural non-farm employment opportunities and urban employment are not catching up with uh, uh, rural population growth. So what, does, what this means is that uh, opportunities for ac youth access to land will remain very important uh, to absorb uh, youth employment in agriculture moving forward uh, on the African continent. Uh, there's also this uh, uh, question about, because we are talking about prosperous agriculture here, uh, there's also the question around uh, productivity and uh, what the continent should do uh, to uh, tap into the educated uh, youth workforce, which is obviously much more educated than the, uh, the older generation. Uh, research actually shows that youth, um, stronger land rights are actually vital for youth uh, to, to have them, uh, give them independent access to land uh, so they can actually have decision-making power around technology, use of technology and practices necessary to enhance uh, agricultural productivity. So there's uh, uh, emerging good research around that. Uh, so while it's, there is some research evidence that youth are turning away from, uh, uh, from agriculture in some countries, uh, uh, youth actually in, in, will continue to be dependent on agriculture moving forward, primarily because of uh, population growth uh, and also uh, absence of uh, non-farm uh, employment opportunities. So uh, broadly, I think Nana Ama and also uh, Innocent have already uh, alluded to this. So broadly from literature, there are three barriers, main barriers really uh, uh, to youth engagement in agriculture. That is access, limited access to fi land, finance and skills. But of course there are others, uh, technology markets and others, but th those three sort of come out uh, very clearly uh, in research. And uh, access to land, as you all know, uh, uh, is really fundamental for youth engagement uh, in agriculture. Um, but yet in sub-Saharan Africa, I think research uh, uh, coming out of IFAD's uh, 2019 Rural Development Report uh, shows that uh, one in three adults is a sole owner of a plot of land, whereas that's only true for about one in 10 young people. Uh, and, and if, if we, st we step back to uh, uh, the, the basics of youth, uh, rural youth access to land in Africa in many countries, and Nana Ama has already alluded to this, traditionally in most countries, uh, youth access to land is through inheritance, but uh, opportunities uh, for inheritance, youth land access through inheritance are slowly be, uh, diminishing uh, because of you know, land scarcity, issues around, uh, uh, you know, land fragmentation uh, and, and, and continued um, uh, population pressure. I, I know that Nana Ama mentioned uh, access is not an issue, but there's also research coming out showing now that uh, uh, about 90% of uh, uh, land in uh, Arab, available arable land in Africa is concentrated in just nine countries. And most of those countries, including the DRC, Sudan and others, are politically uh, fragile countries. So what's happening is that uh, because of land scarcity in, in, in a lot of countries, um, youth access to land uh, is becoming a, a challenge and also costly. Um, there's also in, in many places uh, uh, weakening of uh, the customary systems uh, as a result of urban expansion, uh, uh, land concentration you know, with the urban elites, uh, investors coming in and acquiring land putting so much pressure on, uh, uh, on, on customary systems and reducing even further opportunities for youth to access land. For example, Ethiopia is a very good example of a country that where there's uh, so much land scarcity. 
uh, uh, Zimbabwe as well, uh, uh, at least productive uh, uh, land is, is scarce uh, in Zimbabwe. So what's happening with inheritance, land scarcity, and that, these trends of, uh, there's also a rise of medium scale and large scale farms in countries like uh, uh, Kenya, according to recent research, Tanzania and Uganda to some extent, um, where urban elites are buying land. I think we, we saw this, we're seeing this in Liberia as well, where they are buying you know, um, land you know, between five and 100 hectares uh, and sometimes not even using the land, uh, but just keeping it idle. Uh, that's reducing even opportunities for uh, rural-based youth to uh, access land. And, and you know, actually more, even more importantly, I think research shows that the ability of youth to access land actually influences decisions around migration uh, and, and even livelihood choices. Uh, so the youth that expect, for example, to inherit land in Ethiopia are more likely to stay and, and engage in agriculture compared to those that don't have that uh, expectation. Um, and, and I think finally around this issue of, um, with all the, the, the scarcity issues and uh, challenges with inheritance and uh, limits also even on uh, state land redistribution programs, uh, land rental markets uh, are emerging as sort of like in a potential really uh, promising opportunity uh, for youth to access land uh, on the continent. But uh, the challenge there is that uh, it's also costly for low income youth, youth and uh, it's mostly underdeveloped, I think, in many cases. But it does, I, I think research does show that in countries like Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, where there's some sort of an emerging land market for the youth, that actually can um, be a promising uh, area uh, opportunity for, for youth uh, to access land, given the right policy, uh, uh, obviously. And I think Nana Ama did mention uh, this challenge around limited youth engagement in land governance uh, uh, processes. I think that's really a big hindrance. We're seeing that too in Liberia to youth uh, access to land. Uh, and, and I think overall um, uh, land access opportunities uh, will continue to be a central source of rural youth employment uh, uh, in the context of increased population growth and stagnant or farm uh, employment opportunities. So what that means is that land policies that promote, for example, secure access to land and uh, land rental markets will likely be very influential as, as the continent and governments move towards uh, employment policies and uh, job creation for the youth. And also in terms of even uh, allowing youth to make decisions on whether they actually want to engage in farming or uh, exit farming and maybe towards rural, urban areas or rural to rural migration. Uh, so Grace, I, I, did you want to, did I have time to talk about research gaps uh, uh you thanks so much dr oh, sorry uh dr um tizai uh you will come to that uh okay. in this next, uh set of of uh questions but for now i would like uh innocent just to share with us where has Yila identified opportunities for expanding youth rights and access to land i've heard from uh dr tizai that the issues of uh youth migration will will easily be it will it will easily be stopped if youth are given access to land for them to be able to 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 increase the economic growth for each and every countries that we have issues of migration of youth moving from rural areas to urban areas in search of employment and also issues to do with the uh, uh, multinational companies it has really come strongly nana mentioned about it and also Dr. Tizai also mentioned about it, poor compensation and also lack of youth being in the center of discussion when it comes to large scale land based investment. Thank you so much, Dr. Tizai. So uh, Innocent, you could easily uh, share with us where Yela has identified opportunities for expanding youth rights and access to land. You, you have like three minutes to do that. And I also like to remind our participants uh, to continue sharing their questions, we will answer them just in a few moments. Thank you. To you, Innocent. Yes. Uh, je, je viens rapidement abonder dans le, dans, Innocent? Que, que Are you there? Alors, je, je viens dire que, effectivement, euh, faciliter l'accès pourrait permettre beaucoup de choses. Euh, 
beaucoup d'opportunités au niveau des jeunes. D'abord, les jeunes pourront savoir que euh, ils le savent déjà que l'Afrique, le devenir de l'Afrique, c'est l'agriculture. Et de ce fait, ils aujourd'hui ne savent pas par quel moyen, euh, par quelle voie passer pour pouvoir avoir assez à cette terre et développer l'entrepreneuriat agricole. Et cela, lorsque ces jeunes-là auront assez à la terre, il y a aussi le fait qu'ils doivent être informés et être formés pour savoir qu'ils ont des droits sur les terres et qu'ils sont capables d'entreprendre. Cela pourrait quand même leur éviter, par exemple, les migrations clandestines. OK. Could you just... Uh... Sorry. Uh, if Innocent, you could just share with us the opportunities that, that Yila has identified to expand okay. or for expanding youth rights and access to land in Africa, the opportunities that Yila has identified. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, les opportunités que Yila identifie aujourd'hui sont de plusieurs ordres. Parce que vous voyez, aujourd'hui, lorsque uh, on permet aux jeunes d'avoir assez à la terre, c'est permettre à ce jeune-là de créer beaucoup d'emplois. C'est permettre à ce jeune-là de créer de la richesse. C'est permettre aux jeunes-là de participer au développement et à la croissance économique du pays. C'est permettre à ce jeune-là d'éviter les zones rurales. D'éviter les zones rurales. C'est de permettre aux jeunes de ne plus de ne plus attendre l'État forcément pour dire c'est l'État qui va tout faire pour que moi je vienne ça permet encore aux jeunes par exemple dans les milieux ruraux de pouvoir développer un certain nombre euh, de capacités de capacités au niveau donc des communes surtout des communes donc il est important de savoir que aujourd'hui il y a aussi le renforcement des capacités. Lorsque le Sorry, jeune... Sorry, Innocent, if you could yes. summarize. OK, OK. Euh, donc, je dis rapidement, les opportunités qu'il a identifiées aujourd'hui, c'est les opportunités de formation. Les opportunités d'information. Les opportunités de création d'emplois les opportunités de limitation des zones rurales. Et les opportunités de faciliter une inclusion okay. et développement. Um, sorry, Innocent, de chaque... if you could summarize. Yes, j'ai fini. Madame Gouris, je viens de finir. Okay, merci. Uh... All right. Thanks so much, Innocent, uh, for that. And uh, I would like to pose another question to uh, Nana Ama. What could greater youth access to land mean for the future of agriculture in Ghana? If you could just give us a summary of it in three minutes. What could greater youth access to land mean for the future of agriculture in Ghana? To you, Nana. Thank you, Thank you very much, Grace. So for one thing, we see that in Ghana today, a lot of the agriculture, small scale agricultural activities are left to the older ones to handle. If there is greater access and security of tenure for youth, in rural Ghana, they will be happy to stay back and to invest in agriculture. And that will boost agricultural productivity and actually increase the um, level of employment that youth in agriculture is able to project. The Thank other you. thing that could also result when we have increased access for youth is the fact that there will be limited tensions within the rural areas. Currently, what is happening is that a lot of the commercial activities are taking place and the youth feel that they are dispossessed because of these commercial activities. 
And so there is a lot of tension in many rural areas in Ghana where commercial investments are taking place. And this would minimize when you have greater access to land. Thanks so much, uh, Nana Ama. Now to Dr. Tizai Mahuto, you could, you could just share with us briefly about uh, uh, the research gap that are there when it comes to land governance uh, in youth, and also what are some of the key lessons learned from Landesa youth in land assessment and interventions so far. If you could just give us a summary of the gaps and also the lesson learned from uh, Landesa youth and land access. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. So uh, in terms of research gaps, uh, I, I, there's not a lot of research done uh, on youth access to land specifically, at least compared to uh, women's land rights. So we, we there's a big gap, for example, around gender and age disaggregated uh, country and community level data on youth access to land. Um, including the experience of, of different categories of youth uh, farmers. There's a gap there. Uh, we are missing detailed case study research on rural youth access to land in the context of growing land scarcity, rising land values, uh, weakening customer retainer systems, and uh, diminished, obviously, land inheritance opportunities. We need more evidence on that. Uh, impacts of uh, changing farm size distribution, uh, including the rise of medium and large scale farms on rural youth access to land and livelihood opportunities. Uh, we, that uh, also is a gap. And obviously more country and community level gender and age disaggregate evidence uh, around youth participation in land rental markets uh, and the efficacy of uh, the land rental markets in enhancing rural youth access to land, uh, especially in land scarce region. We also need more research and evidence on promising and scalable rural land access initiatives, including effective ways to address social norms and mm -hmm. practices that hinder uh, rural youth access to land. And I think maybe Yannick uh, and, and Justinus will provide hints to this. Um, in terms of lessons from Landesa, just very quickly, what we have seen uh, doing land tenure assessment, youth land tenure assessments in Kenya is that there is value in doing targeted youth uh, interventions, because that way you can actually get a deeper understanding uh, and uh, and be better design responsive programs to address youth uh, land rights uh, when you just when you actually zero in and do an intentional approach where you really go into the community and try to understand uh, the needs of, of the youth. Um, we also see in, in Liberia, especially the importance of understanding fully the meaning of youth in different contexts uh, because uh, of various variations in the ways in which communities define youth. Uh, that's really a starting point where you need to really do age and gender very specific disaggregation and uh, integrate you know, social um, understandings of youth, social and cultural understandings in all the programs. Um, and, and I think the youth engagement in research and land governance is really key. We see that as we work with our partners, uh, that uh, youth really, uh, uh, one way really to bring youth closer to the land governance and land allocation systems is to ensure that uh, their youth are at the table. And the way to do that is really to work with youth led groups and youth focused civil society organizations. Uh, and we see the value of uh, cross sectoral collaboration with government. Uh, and various civil society organizations promoting youth access to finance, training, um, and, and uh, skills building, as we did, for example, with TechnoSave in Kenya, uh, and as we are exploring opportunities for that in um, Liberia. Uh, and we see also youth land rights gaps in law and policy uh, with very little legal protections for youth outside of uh, the general protections for citizens or at least the minors. So there's some work uh, uh, to be done maybe around laws and policies. And uh, finally, we see anecdotal evidence on uh, the linkages between youth access to land and conflict. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Western Ivory Coast, where I was doing some research back in 2016, in Kenya, uh, coastal region, uh, and, and to some extent, and the DRC where we are having a project with Messi Cops, we see that uh, limited youth access to land as Nana Ama hinted, uh, could actually have some uh, role in you know, reducing tensions, intergenerational tensions between adults and, uh, um, and, um, uh, and youth, parents and sons as in coastal uh, Kenya. 
uh, youth and community elders as in uh, uh, Liberia and also in Zimbabwe, where we see a lot of tensions between youth and formal land administration authorities. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much uh, to Zai for that. It's evidence that uh, if there is a good governance, if there's participation, inclusion of youth in land related issues, we'll have reduced conflict, not only in our community, but also uh, in the continent. And most so uh, in areas where we have uh, increased civil war. Now, uh, thanks so much uh, participants. Uh, can see questions coming through. And uh, this question goes to Dr. Tizai. It is from Kumar, who is listening us from in yeah. And is asking is saying that one of the challenges that I feel is the need to motivate youth to be in this sector with supporting condition of policy profitability of this sector customary pra practices. So uh, Kumar is trying to say or is trying to explain that um, when it comes to customary issues are uh, the ones that contribute uh, mostly for youth not to participate uh, uh, in land related matters. So if you could just speak briefly on that, uh, uh, Dr. Tizai, based on the research that you've done. Mm -hmm. So is this yeah. about uh, how, how best to motivate youth mm -hmm. to engage yes. in farming? Yeah, yes, so, the, so, so customary the, practices. Or within, within the customary uh, practices. Mm. Yeah, so I think, uh, um, so youth uh, in general, they would like profitable agriculture. They would like uh, productive agriculture. But in terms of working within customary uh, settings, I, I think we have a very good example that I saw in Burkina Faso where a um, young women's group NGO was actually working with customary authorities to uh, get access to land for sheer butter production. Uh, and I think it took them some time, but I think being able to uh, negotiate with customary authorities to deal with uh, challenges around uh, social norms and practices, that is discrimination around uh, uh, youth access to land. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the motivating uh, factors where you can, um, first you have to have profitable agriculture. So the example I'm giving in Burkina Faso is that sheer butter, there's already a market for that. Uh, and the, what the youth, at least the young women needed was access to land. And what they needed was then to, explain to the customer authorities the value of uh, youth engaging in sheer butter production, what it does to their livelihoods, what it does to the communities, what it does to the respect that the young women are now getting from the communities. And okay. I think out of that, there was like 800 young women who um, managed to gain access to land. So it's, 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 it's not as, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I'm just giving you an example that it's that. You are ties that to, to the customer system. Yes, you are. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Dr. Tizai. Now, there's another question here for Nana. Uh, there's somebody who has just written in, and I think he's one of our participants uh, coming from Ghana, and he's trying to find out, um, now in case of youth, are there any civil society group in Ghana fighting for the land rights for youth? Are there organic youth associations that are organizing the voices of youth on land issues. I think this participant wants to know more and if possible, perhaps um, he or she can join. So Nana, you can share with us if there's such association or civil society fighting for the land rights for youths in Ghana. Yes, so I think I tried to give a brief response to that question on the chat. But basically, Colander is working across the country in all the regions of Ghana. And we are trying to work to support the different categories of groups, women, youth, traditional leaders, queen mothers, and so on and so forth. The focus of our work is actually to build capacity, to give training, to sensitize, and to facilitate inclusion of youth and all other people in the land governance system. So if you go to some of the traditional areas, we have worked with some of the youth on how they have to work together to negotiate compensation for the land that has been acquired for some investment. So activity is going, in fact, there's a lot going on. Just that, you know, the policy environment is such that it doesn't cater for the youth. 
And so what we are doing currently is almost always at the local level. But okay. we are working with policy access to ensure that we have policies that are also friendly to the youth, and that includes the youth also. Okay, thank you so much. I'm happy to hear that Coladef is doing quite a lot of work in Ghana to ensure youth participation in land governance is there. Now to you, Innocent, we have a question for you. How can the commitment of young African to land tenure be effective in the context of lack of training of young people in the new land tenure professional? And also I have another question from Ahmad from Senegal. He's saying that uh, young people are frustrated with land, uh, in land, young people are getting frustrated when it comes to land matters. But how can we make a proper commitment if young people are not well informed and trained in new land tenure professional? So uh, perhaps, you know, Saint, you could just give us a uh, talk about that briefly before now we go to our second session. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Uh, merci beaucoup. C'est très important, ces questions-là. Je crois qu'on ne peut pas engager les jeunes sans qu'ils ne soient formés ni informés. C'est pour ça que précédemment j'ai dit l'objectif principal de YILA aujourd'hui qui est en train de faire eh, la vulgarisation des tests eh, de loi foncière des pays membres pour permettre aux jeunes de mieux comprendre, de mieux comprendre leurs droits et devoirs et Pour pouvoir assurer la formation, nous avons mis en place une plateforme d'e-learning. Et cette plateforme d'e-learning permettra à chaque jeune d'être formé en ligne, tout au moins au métier, au nouveau métier en matière foncière. Ça permettra quand même aux jeunes d'avoir des certifications et de pouvoir être, de pouvoir être en même temps dans la fièvre des nouveaux métiers en matière foncière pour qu'on puisse avoir beaucoup plus d'ambassadeurs, défenseurs beaucoup plus d'ambassadeurs, promoteurs, donc uh, des questions foncières en Afrique. Merci beaucoup. Okay. All right. Um, thanks so much. Uh, the final question goes to uh, Nana. Uh, what practical strategies can be applied to promote women and young people access to land, especially for agriculture purposes? beyond policy change, which takes forever to happen and also the implementation part of it, sometimes it's not there. So what are some of the practical st strategies can be applied to promote women land rights and also youth access to land? Just yes. a brief to you, Nana. Yeah, so the question is deep, but you want a brief answer. So I'll be very brief. The brief answer is that in Ghana, land is organized around a certain social group. It is local. And within that local context, there are various customary rules and practices that govern how land can be applied and used. So our focus is that beyond policy, we are working targeting the different traditional areas and the land practices. And through that, we are able to provide opportunity to educate, to build the institutional capacity of traditional leaders so that the rules of how they manage the land would change at the local level to have inclusion of women and youth. That way, it makes it easier, it is faster, and it is possible to see action within some short time. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, panelists. Thank you, participants, for actively participating. We've had in our first uh, round of uh, discussion issues to do with social political uh, issues. Uh, one is one of the things that are making youth not to participate uh, in land matters. Multinational companies coming into our countries uh, and issues of implementation of large scale land based investment is also an issue that we need to address and also the customary and also traditional um, laws. Uh, are the ones that are hindering women and also youth to participate uh, uh, in land matters. And one good thing that it has also come from our panelists is that the future of Africa is in agriculture and the youth will continue to engage in agriculture in future. So I'm looking forward uh, uh, by 2023, we'll have increased uh, youth engagement in land governance as a 10 implementation plan 
for the African Union Agenda 2063. Thank you so much, uh, participants, and continue sharing in your questions, your, your recommendations. And for now, I hand it over to my colleague, Carol, who is going to take us through the next session. To you, Carol. Thank you so much, Grace, for that wonderful moderation and for leading us through such an interesting conversation with our three first panelists, Innocent, Nana Ama, and Tizai. I learned a lot from that conversation. And I heard, as you did, I think, Grace, some common themes coming through, uh, including those you just mentioned, but also this question of what are some practical as well as some policy approaches to engage youth in order to, to productively, efficiently use land um, as a way to address some challenges around rural economic and social development. So I'm really delighted to pick up from your good leadership, Grace, and introduce our next two panelists. Um, first, let me take this opportunity to introduce Mr. Justice Wambai, who is a land administration specialist with over eight years of experience working on land policy advocacy, the establishment of land information management systems, participatory community resource mapping, and securing of land rights in Sub-Saharan Africa. Justice has worked with organizations that include Oxfam, UN Habitat, the FAO, and the Society of International Development. Currently, he's a program specialist for Cadasta Foundation, one of the um, sponsors today uh, of, the, of the webinar, leading efforts to document land rights in Eastern Africa and beyond. Very glad to have you, Justice, and we'll turn to your question in just a moment. Also today, we're very pleased to welcome Yannick Fiedler, who is a program officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO. Yannick is coordinating, very interesting, a series of projects in North and West Africa, which aim to strengthen the enabling environment for responsible investment in agriculture and food systems with a very strong focus on youth. He's the author of several publications and the developer of capacity development tools, which would be great for us to hear a little bit about maybe in the chat or elsewhere um, in the conversation. His most recent works focus on empowering youth in the African region. He's a native of Germany, but Yannick holds, holds a master's degree from Science Po in France. And he's the father of a little girl. Well, that's nice to hear. Congratulations. Uh, welcome, Yannick. Okay, so for this section, uh, we are going to do a similar, we're going to take a similar approach to the taken by Grace in the previous session. I will ask Justice a question, then I'll ask Yannick a question. Um, please continue as you've been doing to enter your great questions either in the Q&A or in the chat, uh, and we'll get to them after two rounds of questions. So Justice, I'm going to turn right to you for the first question, which is, um, what can better data collection do to help close the gaps in our knowledge around youth land rights. Over to you, Justice. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carol. Um, I, it was uh, exciting uh, listening to the initial presentation. And actually my presentation will also be speaking, my answer to your question also be speaking partly to what they have said. Um, without um, land data, we can say that structuring intervention to secure youth land rights it's just like uh, walking blindfolded in a busy and familiar street. So many things could go wrong. You know? At the moment, and as the people who have presented before me um, have alluded to, is there's so little data on youth land rights. Um, there is a major data gap bearing in mind that youth constitute uh, three quarters of the African population and account for around 60% of the total unemployed persons. We are coming into argument that indeed agriculture, as we see it uh, for Africa, um, is kind of one of the main um, livelihood opportunities for youth. But agriculture is purely land based. It's purely land based, but we don't have information about this, um, how youth relate to land. So, 
how can we solve unemployment if we really don't know what we are dealing with? So data and more specifically, especially linked data on youth land rights will enable us to, number one, understand the status of youth land rights in Africa. Um, I've been listening to the initial presentation and one thing that is coming out clearly is that youth is not a homogeneous group. There are very many nuances that need to be teased out. But how do we do this? How do we address the different uh, age groups that constitute youth? Uh, how do we uh, address the different um, dynamics between the male and female youth? The different context, the difference between the urban and rural youth, the difference between the educated or non-educated youth. Also, let's not forget about youth with disabilities. We have to understand this. Number two, having um, youth um, data on youth land rights will help us in conceptualizing and advocating for informed policy and program intervention. To continue, this data, we all, um, analyzing this data will also help us to build scenarios that will enable us to predict and anticipate issues and trends in relation to youth access to land rights. Lastly, considering the nexus between land, agriculture, climate change, political participation, food security, nutrition, youth land data will help the uh, stakeholders to develop solutions that are not only inclusive, but also sustainable. That said, how do we structure data collection to help the bridge of youth land data gap? Number one, we have to ensure that we provide necessary tools and appropriate approaches. Are the tools for data collection easy to use by youth? Are they accurate enough? Do, can we store our data well? Uh, the data that we collect, is it interoperable? Can we compare data that we get from Ghana and data that we get from Kenya? Um, do we provide adequate disaggregation of this data to ensure that this data reflect the heterogeneity of the different groups that constitute the youth demographic? At Cadastra Foundation, uh, we are providing platform and tools that offer the opportunity to collect, store, manage, and analyze data. We see the importance of having youth in this process and building their capacities. In that, we provide these technical tools to organization on, um, most of which are youth-led or are, uh, the technical teams led by youth, but we also go ahead and train them on how they can use these tools. Um, that for instance, we, have an, an, we are having an upcoming virtual training where we are really targeting grassroots organizations. And these tools, I tell you, they've done so much. Um, youth are tech serve, uh, serving. If you give them tools, they do a lot. Like, I'm going to explain as we continue this session. Thank you very much, Carol. Justice, thank you so much for that. Um, a couple of very interesting points, and I just really want to emphasize and agree with your comment that youth are not homogenous, and so have distinct different needs, um, either at different times of their life or based on uh, different characteristics, whether those are ethnic, gender-related, um, abled or disabled. So thank you for reminding us of that, of that important point. And I'm looking forward to coming back to you for uh, further, further discussions around how to engage youth in data collection. Um, Yannick, let us, let's turn to you now. Uh, we, would, we would be really interested in hearing based on your work, um, what are some of the main challenges that young agri entrepreneurs who do want to invest in farms and businesses face today? And what are some steps that policymakers and other stakeholders can take to really unlock the potential of youth to create more thriving agricultural and food systems? Yannick, over to you. Thank you, Carol. And, and thank you for this great question. I mean, I couldn't agree more with a lot of things that have been said already. And, and one of the important points that was just highlighted now is the need for more data, right? And when we started our work, I, I'm just starting with that three years ago, uh, because we wanted to know, you know, what kind of an enabling environment is needed to empower young agri-entrepreneurs uh, to invest in their farms and businesses. We found that there was 
very little information out there. And so we, we carried out um, capacity assessments and, and planning processes together with young agri-entrepreneurs, governments, financial institutions, NGOs, and incubators with 11 African countries across the continent with, with support from Switzerland. And so there we tried to see a bit the kind of challenges that they faced, and we asked them to, to rank these challenges and prioritize them, right? And among the 20 or 30 factors we asked them, quite obviously, the principal challenge really that came up was access to land as a major challenge that was almost consistently ranked out if you look at like a scale from zero to five, where zero is nothing and five is, is excellent, it was almost consistently ranked one out of five, except for two cases, which are Mali and Tunisia, which I may have the opportunity to get back to later. Um, and then second to that is access to commercial credits and insurance schemes. Um, so this is especially crucial, you know, for young agri entrepreneurs who may not have the opportunity to access the land through their families. And they may need to take these loans uh, or even to buy equipment or invest in, in, in their own human capital. So this, this was another challenge. And the third, is access to information and technical services. So this one that includes incubator, extension, fared slightly better, um, but there are some important variations between cities and larger towns on the one hand and the more remote areas on the other. And one important issue that we identified in regard to these three and other services and factors of production is that in, in many cases, um, youth may have access to one or other of these services or factors of production, um, but they may lack the others to complement them. So let's be very practical. For example, a young person may have access to land, but cannot access financial services to buy equipment or access technical support services to understand how to use equipment and, and therefore still may fail to develop a thriving business, right? Then, of course, if you look at these three challenges, right, access to land, access to financial services, and access to information and technical services, what are some of the underlying challenges? And here, pretty much, of course, on the one hand, there are market imperfections. That's pretty clear. Um, information asymmetries play an important role. For example, between a young agri-entrepreneur and a bank about the bankability of the entrepreneur, and there are also issues of inefficient allocation of resources and, and capital. This partially explains the challenge, right? But then there are important other factors that we need to take into account. Uh, one of it has been mentioned by Innocent, which is the capacity of the youth um, to understand uh, their own rights, their, um, what actually they need to know in order to access a service. How does it work? How do you apply? Does it exist? These kind of things, of course, also play an important role. So you look at it from the market side and the youth's own capacity side. But then what really interested us, uh, and I think it's, it's very key, is that, of course, public policies, public services, and, and public investment incentives could play a major role to address these challenges. And, and quite unfortunately, currently, this is not always happening. Uh, and and there, there are some things that could be done um, in order to improve the young agri entrepreneurs access to vital services and factors of production um, through well-targeted uh, and, and well-conceived investment incentives, which can include financial incentives, such as concessional and non-concessional loan schemes or loan guarantees in this, in, in this case for banks, information and technical services or land distribution programs. So if, if you allow me, I would just want to share briefly five recommendations that we have come up with on how to ensure that these incentives really correspond to the needs of young agri entrepreneur and have a maximum impact on the ground. So the first one, and I think this is a very important point that somewhat complements uh, what has already been said, is that it is 
key, absolutely key to empower and engage youth organizations in design of policies and investment incentives to ensure that they're needs driven. And this may of course include providing support to these organizations to strengthen their own capacities to engage in policy dialogue. This is, this is very, very key since in many cases, the youth organizations may be confronted with very well-informed stakeholders who may be better placed to defend their own interests, right? So their, their own capacities also need to be strengthened. The second one is that when it comes to designing investment incentives, it's quite important to ensure that they're youth specific and that they contain very clear targeting criteria and conditions that match development priorities. So here again, uh, I, I make reference to, to an important point that has been made is that youth are not a homogeneous group. And depending on the needs and the situation within that country, you could imagine targeting a specific group of youth that has a particular need or a particular capacity to generate returns on investment, right? And this, this can include educated, uneducated youth, gender considerations within youth or a regional focus, for example. The third point is the need to provide a coherent and structured package of incentives rather than standalone mechanisms. So here again, it relates to the point I made before, right? You, you, you wish to ensure that whenever a young person starts his own business, starts his own farm, uh, does not only have the land, but also the capital and the, the information needed to make the business thrive. And here it's, it's, it's vital to ensure that these incentives, they fill a gap and that they do correct market imperfections rather than crowding out in, in existing initiatives. And then the fourth point is to develop a youth sensitive and context specific communication strategy. Again, before I said, in many cases, quite amazing things may exist and may be put in place, but the young people may not always be aware that they exist, or they may not understand how to apply to um, support mechanisms. And then the fifth and the last point, and I think this has been said before, but it doesn't hurt to repeat it, is to ensure that the overall policy and legal framework empowers young agri-entrepreneurs. And here, one particular aspect <clears throat> um, regards, of course, the, the land laws. Uh, may they be legal or may they be customary, uh, where there may be particular challenges uh, for, for young women when it comes to inheritance, for example, right? So these are the five uh, recommendations I wanted to mention. And with this, over to you and, and thank you. Yannick, thank you so much. Um, and thanks for doing that in such uh, an efficient way. Both you and Justice did great with your timing. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, I also want to note that I, I think this, um, this point around adopting holistic approaches to engagement with youth to really drive and improve the enabling environment is such an important one. Um, and to do that work, to get to that, those improved enabling environments, Justice, I'm going to come back to you because improved policy really has to be built on a basis of, of good evidence and understanding what the data is telling us about the needs of different groups on the ground. So, so let me ask you, how, how is it that we can structure grassroots data collection to improve youth engagement in land and to really spark the kind of agricultural growth that will lead to transformation in rural areas. So again, over to you, Justice. Thank you so much. And, and before I, I talk about how we can do it, um, maybe if you allow me, let me just briefly uh, say how data collection had been done, was being done previously. I also started my career as a data collector. And data collection exercises have been found to be, mostly were found to be mostly top down, uh, being led by a research organization or a government. They just go to the field, they start collecting data. You don't know how, where they found the questions. Um, sometimes uh, I remember going to situations whereby you go to collect data and they tell you the same, we have been, we have series of people coming here asking us the same questions. Um, and this could be led to so many things, such as lack of standardization um, in the data collection exercise, lack of appropriate tools, 
and um, whereby you can collect data and share it among your organization, and also um, inadequate uh, dis disaggregation of data. At the Foundation and working with youth in Africa, we have come to understand that um, uh, successful data collection should not be seen as an event, but as a process. Data collection should be a cl clearly thought out uh, process. One, you should identify the scope of data collection, conduct a stakeholder analysis to understand who is here and what they do and how you can involve them. And research on what data is already available and how you can leverage on it. One important aspect is also choice of tools for data collection and analysis. All these are very uh, are key ingredients to the success of the, of the process. But still, when you have all this, you should always uh, recognize that data collection is people-centric and it should be participatory. We should, not, we should also take note of the different cultural and gender consideration that might hinder the involvement of youth in the process. From my experience, this is how we have worked with youth to have more than 2 million people on the Cadastra platform. Number one, we have empowered youth through training and provision of tools to participate in the land governance processes. Involve the youth from the word go. When you're going to do the, uh, um, when you're starting to create the survey, involve youth, let them come in, let them also give them, uh, let them also give you uh, the ideas. We believe in giving youth a chance to run the process. Through youth, we have been able to do analysis of map data and successfully advocated and prevented the eviction of over 41,000 families in Nairobi. In Zimbabwe, in Zambia, I mean, working with youth-led organization, we have been able to collect data on the impact of illegal um, mining on youth. The second thing that we need to do is uh, we do is use um, of international uh, standards, but we make sure that we adopt it to the local context. International standards such as the social China domain model, how we show the different party, uh, party spatial relationships, but we do it in a way that we contextualize the African context. Also, having a standard metric for monitoring and evaluating the different components relating to security of tenure. In all the data collection exercises that we, uh, we conduct across the continent, we have constant, uh, we have uh, what you can say standard questions that we ask that help us to be able to tease out these things. The, what I was talking about earlier on about um, disaggregated data. Number three is provision of easy to use tools to support data collection and analysis. It is very hard to analyze, um, especially data on land uh, that is not spatially linked. But mostly uh, tools that support data collection, uh, spatially linked data collection, are very expensive. How then do we get easy to use, um, easy or affordable tools? That's what we do as Cadastra. We provide that. And um, in doing this, we, we have seen tremendous growth in the kind of data that is coming out and impacting on, on, on research. We also ensure that our process are bottom up. We work with organizations already on the ground, already understanding the context. And we make sure that we bring everyone on board. And they're the ones who lead us through the process. We ensure participation, participation of, members of youth, participation of women, participation of uh, civil society to government. Number four, and this, this is something that's grappling with the land sector, and um, I'm sure we can all agree, um, financing. Financing is an ingredient to success, but uh, as you can all agree, uh, we have um, the budget that is set around for land both by the government and uh, the donor community, is kind of shrinking over the time, over time. 
it is up to us, NGOs and agency working on land, to continue putting out information of the importance or the centrality of land in the development agenda. Just as people, people need to see land to be of equal importance at health issues. There's also analysis and presentation of data. It is just not enough to collect data. How can we translate this data into easily understandable format, such as a dashboard? Also, we thrive at promoting collaboration and synergies. We, to identify the strength of different actors within um, the field and try and leverage it. If we're good at providing tools, somebody else is good at advocacy. How can we leverage between the two? Lastly, uh, when we talk about youth involvement, we do not only mean involvement outside the statutory system or as volunteers. Land professional organizations should make it easier for young surveyors to practice and develop their careers by having clear and elaborate steps for one to move from being a graduate surveyor or to a licensed surveyor. It should not only be based on, on merely on luck, as it seemed to be the case, uh, uh, the, case, the case across the continent. Thank you so much, Kyle. Justice, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate that. And uh, again, underscoring your initial um, message, which was in make sure that you involve youth from the start and keep them involved throughout all the activities so that we understand demand and can be responding to uh, the demands of youth with regard to participating in the agricultural sector and in land governance. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have about 25 minutes left in our session. I'm gonna ask Yannick one last question from me, then we're gonna turn over to your questions. I can see that you have some very interesting questions in both the chat and the question and answer function. So uh, we'll get to those um, very shortly. Yannick, uh, a question from us to you. What are some of the current efforts that you've seen that are strengthening youth access to land in Africa and what are you seeing as good practices or interesting cases that we can learn from? Thank you very much. And, and first of all, I, I think the positive um, side is that this youth issue and youth access to land is, is really gaining a lot of interest, right? And it's, it's not only the webinar we're doing here today, but it's it's a lot of initiatives and that's, that's very good. Um, I think let's let's take a step back and, and, and reflect a bit. How can young people access land, right? They can access land either through inheritance, through the market, or through distribution, right? And what, what we have discussed before and, and a lot of evidence we heard points to that fact that accessing land through inheritance becomes increasingly difficult for a young person. He may he or she may access the land when they're older, but um, it's, it's, it's getting difficult for, for all of them to, to get their share through inheritance. So this leaves the opportunities of accessing land through the market or through distribution, right? This, this, these are the two most likely maybe in a lot of cases. So through the market, there is, is one eg existing interesting case that may be useful to share, which are the Tunisian land loans. That's quite an interesting case. So basically, this is a loan scheme that is provided by the Tunisian Agriculture Investment Promotion Agency in partnership with the National Agricultural Bank to young graduates up to 40 years who uh, have identified a piece of, of land that is available and that they cannot buy with their own funds. So the interesting thing about these land loans is that they have an extremely long grace period. I think it's, it's seven years now with the revised investment code and that the self-financing uh, ratio is, is very, very small. So it, it allows these young graduates to access land on the markets through that land loan mechanism. And in addition to the land loan, there is an add-on loan that the young agri-entrepreneur can request which allows them 
to do um, the necessary work to, um, how shall I say it, like buy the necessary irrigation equipment and do the electrification. There is additional loan for that, which they call uh, le prêt d'aménagement. So that's, that's an interesting case that may be useful to share because it's something that strangely enough is not very well known. Uh, but I always find it interesting to share that one. Now, if we look at land through distribution, there we have a couple of cases that have either recently introduced a specific youth quota in distribution programs or that aim to do so. One country that has actually already done so very recently is Mali. And in Mali, in the recent Loi sur le foncier agricole, the LFA, uh, you have a specific quota for uh, youth organizations and women's organizations. I think it's it's 15% uh, of the land that is being allocated to, to either of these organizations. And I think part of the reason why there is this specific quota is due to the fact that Mali has a pretty well organized umbrella organization of rural youth that somewhat seats in all these negotiations, right? Then there is an even more ambitious target from what I know, uh, but this is currently under discussion, is the, the new land allocation policy in South Africa, where I think they even aim not 15, but 50%, I think 40 or 50% of the land being allocated uh, to, uh, to youth. So it should be 50% for, uh, for women, 40% to youth, and 10% for people living with disabilities. I think this is, this is what is currently under discussion under the smallholder component of that land allocation policy. And even though um, these are very few examples, they do show that this idea of considering the specific needs of youth um, in regard to accessing land is gaining traction, which is per se a positive thing. Yannick, thank you for those excellent practical um, uh, examples. I think it's really interesting to think about the land loan example. It ties back to comments from the first session that we heard that, um, that even if youth wish to access land, the financial resources that are required can be quite difficult for them to um, to get to, to get together. And so it can be, uh, the, those financial barriers can be difficult to overcome. And yeah, also interesting to hear about Mali. So thank you so much, Yannick. And thank you, Justice. I'm gonna turn to questions now and we have several really interesting questions. Um, Yannick, I'm gonna start with you. There is uh, a, an observation and a question from Ahmet Diallu in Senegal, which is saying that, um, which you may know that recently more than 300 youth um, died in, uh, as they were traveling across the ocean to, to migrate up to Europe. Do you think that youth access to land um, in order to, to engage in agriculture in a more secure way could be one solution for the kind of clandestine emigration that you were seeing from Africa to Europe? I think a really important question. Thank you, Mr. Diallo, for that question. Merci beaucoup. Je pense que c'est une question très importante et il faut évidemment que nous nous interrogions de manière très, très sérieuse euh, sur les différentes stratégies qui permettent d'éviter ces drames liés à la migration de détresse. Permettez-moi, excuse me, please let me respond to this question in French so it may be easier even to engage on this. Je pense que c'est vraiment Let's, très, très important. As ah? It's better for me to respond in French. Parfait. <laughs> et, et, et je pense que, bien évidemment, euh, donner, think... améliorer, renforcer l'accès à la terre euh, pour les jeunes est l'une des, des stratégies qui... To make better permettra... access the land to the earth and like that could be better to... Maybe we could hold on the French to English translation and, and allow Yannick to, um, to complete it. it. That might be uh, good at this moment. And then Yannick, if you wanted to just do a very quick sum in English, that would be, that would be great. Sure, I can do that. Okay, great, perfect. 
et, et que donc bien évidemment qui permettront donc à okay. de Evid donner évidently it could be it could allow to Can I, can I just request that we hold the translation for just a moment and let's let Yannick uh, répondre en français, s'il vous plaît. Okay, merci. <laughs> Et que donc, qui, qui permettront euh, aux jeunes d'avoir de meilleures perspectives. Je pense maintenant, comme je l'ai dit précédemment, il faut bien évidemment compléter euh, ces programmes qui visent à renforcer l'accès à la terre par d'autres mécanismes d'intervention, et ce, euh, dans le secteur agricole et au-delà du secteur agricole. Dans le secteur agricole, il convient également, bien évidemment, de renforcer l'accès aux jeunes, aux au, au programmes de financement, à l'information. Il faut également qu'il y ait un écosystème d'accès au marché qui, qui permet aux jeunes de, de s'épanouir dans le secteur agricole. Au-delà du secteur agricole, euh, je pense également qu'il faut Selon le contexte du pays, pensez bien évidemment à d'autres mécanismes de protection sociale euh, qui permettent également aux jeunes qui toutefois rencontrent des moments de difficulté euh, de ne pas se trouver dans des situations de détresse. Donc, je, je pense qu'il faut vraiment penser à, à cette question de la migration des détresses euh, comme euh, nécessitant un ensemble d'interventions dont, bien évidemment, le renforcement de l'accès à la terre est l'un des piliers qui euh, recèle d'une importance particulière. Excellent, merci Yannick. Um, so, recognizing that we are coming a little bit closer to the end of our time together, uh, let me turn back to you, Justice, if I may. Uh, I will note that we have an observation in the chat around the importance uh, when it comes to communications of communicating with youth of highlighting the success stories of young people, young women and men who've succeeded as a result of having access to land. So I wondered, Justice, if you could share with us very briefly some one or two of the success stories you've had at the Cadasta Foundation Uh, perhaps around including youth as data collectors, or if you've followed up and seen what's happened as a result of engaging and providing youth with more secure rights to land. So what's a, what's a success story that you would like to highlight from your experience at Cadasta? Um, there are very many success stories, but um, um, one that um, I mentioned was um, um, we worked with a youth, uh, a youth led organization in Zambia um, to be able to map areas um, where there were illegal mining of manganese. Um, the youth led organization uh, having youth as data collectors, they were able to go to the community and collect data of the areas where mining, illegal mining was being done. And when we talk about data it's not only attribute data, but spatial data. And then we are able to collect uh, data about the people living around their, uh, their social tenure. Um, how do they feel uh, their perception about their tenure security and the effects of the mining that has had on their livelihood. And we are also uh, able to also collect the perception about the land governance structures that they that um, that um, they uh, that exist within that community. And, um, the community. This is a success story. Why? Because um, this is a youth-led organization. They are able to identify their own problem, but they did not have tools to do that. We assisted them in doing that. We gave them the tools, trained them. They did it by themselves. Had the data help them analyze the data, then give the data to them, and they went and advocated for, uh, for, for, for their rights in their land agencies, having evidence using uh, these tools. Another one is here in Kenya, um, uh, with an indigenous community, if you know the Ogiek people, we have been helping um, uh, the Ogiek people through um, OPDP, 
uh, which is uh, as much as it has, um, most of the technical officers are youth like me, uh, we have been able to use our tools to be able to demarcate the land, create, as you said, talking about highlighting the stories, create out story maps, that uh, we get out a story that has a special element to it, that is interactive, that anyone, even if you don't have a GIS knowledge, you can have a look at it you, um, and understand what is happening at what point. And lastly, is the halting of uh, the eviction of 41,000 families in Nairobi. This was also done by youth through a story map and through um, uh, sitting uh, on our laptops and them uh, having training them and give, uh, giving them the tools. We are able to do an, an, an analysis of how many people are going to be affected um, according to the government, uh, the government released out data. And when they did that and presented it in a map, uh, in a story map and took it to the government, they stepped back and the evictions were halted. Those are the kind of the success stories when we give these tools to you. Just and sometimes you just don't know what they're gonna do, it, uh, what they're going to do. You just give them tools, but what they do out of it is what sometimes even it, uh, it surprises us. Surprising and um, very powerful. Thank you. Thanks for those great examples. Uh, I'm a, a huge, I love story maps and I uh, think they're, they can be a really powerful tool. So great to hear that those, those tools um, led to, so I'm going to turn back to you, Yannick, because I want to draw a linkage now uh, based on what Justice was just sharing with us. Um, I think one of the themes we've heard through the course of our discussion today is that youth themselves not only need to be involved in decision making, but it's critically important for them to have the information and the skills to generate the data that can lead to good policies. So we have a question from Dr. Kadaido in Ghana, who is saying, um, uh, how is it that we can drive more research on youth issues so that we increase data availability and really get to those demand-driven policy changes uh, that will lead to an improved enabling environment? I'm going to um, let you answer this, and then we'll probably begin our wrap-up. So Yannick, back to you. Yeah, I think that's that's a very important question, and we we have designed this kind of capacity analysis tools, which I will be glad to share with you. Uh, in, in general, what I think, and Justice has made this point, um, the aspect of participatory research in, in really engaging the youth in, in the design, you know, of your own tools, this is, this is one thing, but also working with them throughout your research is really key to understand their actual needs. This being said, and this is why I insisted on the fact that we worked with so many different actors, it's quite important to complement that information that you receive from the youth with the information that is provided by, by other actors, you know, that, that are working um, in providing the services and in developing the policies and laws um, that benefit or affect youth in one way or another. And one interesting thing that may come out in your, in your research, I guess, then would be the kind of information asymmetries or information, even incoherences that you may find occasionally because of different understandings people may have about um, the, the existence of services or the meaning of policies and laws and um, the existence of different types of incentives. And that's that's quite stimulating. And starting from there, then, of course, you could somewhat focus on, on the kind of um, areas that, that you identify that, that have a specific interest, right? That where you identify a particular challenge. I think in our end, this is what happened in, in Tunisia. I will just go on that for, for just a minute, if you allow me, Carol. Is what we started in Tunisia is we identified a paradox. And the paradox was that you have, on the one hand, a very, very educated youth, uh, and, at the and at the very same time, um, a very high unemployment rate among the educated youth, which, which is nothing you would normally expect, right? You would think that with an increased education, the, the unemployment rate would fall, but it's, it's quite the opposite. And at the same time, you have lots of programs and incentives that are provided to the youth, 
and there are investment opportunities out there. And at the same time, you don't see that these investment opportunities are seized by the youth. So that there is this kind of paradox. And we started with that paradox to really identify the kind of challenges that the youth faced on the ground. And, and by doing so, we, we found interesting things that then enabled us to go forward and, and, and design a project together with, um, with the local research institute and the ministry to, to go forward. So that's, that's just my small idea I, I, I would give as, as a response to your question. I hope that at least answered it partially. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you, Yannick. Yes, I, I hope, Dr. Kadaido, that that got to some of the um, some of what you were thinking about. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're we're drawing close to the end of our time together. I can see that there are a number of questions that still remain in the Q and A, and I think what we'll expect to do is try to provide some additional responses in a follow up message. Uh, after the webinar, so coming up in the not too distant future, perhaps along with the recording of the webinar, as well as some other materials that we're hoping to share with you um, that will complement the conversations we've had today with our five different panelists. I'm going to take a moment and just um, uh, not completely summarize the discussion because uh, I won't do justice to the richness of this conversation, but I'll do a little bit of a summary and then um, turn the floor back over to Innocent, our main host, to thank you all for being here. Um, before I start my summary, though, let me once again thank Yaila for the opportunity to participate in this discussion today. Let me also thank uh, Kolandef Kadasta, the Land Portal, which has helped support this, uh, uh, this discussion and has um, done such a good job of advertising it. Fao and Afrique Midi, merci beaucoup à tous. Um, so what we've heard today is that uh, there, this is, a, this is a, an enormously important issue, the issue of youth productively accessing land in Africa. Um, it's an issue that's gaining ground, gaining, it, no pun intended there, gaining attention uh, not only with governments, but with donors and with civil society. And it's critically important if we're, if we're interested in addressing a variety of challenges, which are not only economic, but as well social and political as the question of migration perhaps underscored. Um, we've heard some very practical examples of how different youth organizations or different civil society organizations are addressing the challenges that young men and young women face. We heard about the different ways in Ghana, for example, that youth are working to, not, to address uh, and access land, but we also heard of the challenges associated with power relations and identity issues, as well as lack of information. Um, we heard quite a lot actually about the research gaps and how um, gaps in research might be making it a little bit harder for us to respond in a very targeted way through policy or legal and regulatory frameworks to the needs that youth have when it comes to accessing land productively. But we also heard that there are many opportunities that exist for youth to come together among themselves with other stakeholders to try to identify practical solutions to identify and use lands. I think it was interesting. We heard several comments around responsible land-based investments and we actually had a question I, um, which I appreciated around that issue. So, uh, and how can youth, how are youth both impacted negatively but what's the potential for them to engage positively around responsible investing? I think for me, finally, I wanna take away, I'm going to take away uh, the following three important messages. Number one, that engagement uh, of youth in agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa needs to be a holistic exercise, not only focused on access to land, which is important, but recognizing that, uh, that access to land may be a necessary but not a sufficient condition to supporting positive youth engagement in the land sector. I heard um, and really appreciated the, um, the recognition that youth are not a homogenous group. They have different needs 
and, and are living in different contexts. And we need to be sensitive to those differences to develop um, the, the appropriate holistic responses for them. And then finally, the third takeaway message, engage youth right from the start, not just maybe one group of youth, but understanding again, these, homo these heterogeneous groups of youth, bring their voice to the table, engage them throughout processes. For me, a very rich conversation, lots and lots of learning. I want to sincerely thank all the panelists who've joined us today, Justice Mwambei from Kadasta, Yannick Fiedler from the FAO, Nana Amayira from Kolandef, Innocent from Yaila, and my dear colleague, Dr. Tazai Malto from Landessa. Thank you for being here with us. And I'd like to also extend my very warm thanks to the co-moderator, our co-moderator from Oxfam, Grace Ananda. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to work with you, Innocent. Let me at the last moment give you the floor. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci à tout un chacun. Thank you so much. Thank you for all. Tous les participants. I would like to thank all the participants. Landesa. Nous sommes ravis. To thank all the partners, Landesa. Est ravi de vous avoir. And all the team of Hila. Merci à Merci à Kadastra. À Kadastra. And really, Afaou, really, really Paolo thank you for Yannick. all of them and Kadasa and Fao and Yannick Zwell. And tous les partenaires qui thank you for everybody, nous. for everyone, Kadasta, for all the partners who stay la, with us. À la présidente de Kadasta Foundation. Et actuellement, je crois thank que nous sommes à la fin. Et ce que je voudrais lancer comme mot d'ordre fort, c'est la mutualisation des efforts. On ne doit plus travailler de façon séparée, mais il faut qu'on mutualise les efforts afin que cela puisse aller à l'endroit de la cible qu'est la jeunesse africaine. Merci beaucoup. Je souhaite à chacun une très bonne suite de journée. Merci. Merci. Et Madame Carole. Allô? Hello?